Good morning, Revolution, and welcome to Good Morning Revolution. And happy one five oh anniversary of the Paris Commune. Yeah, y'all. Vive la commune. Vive. How do you say that? Vive la commune. Okay, there you go. I'm not going to try to cop a French accent. I sound silly. Not that I'm afraid of sounding silly. I mean, <laughs> you gotta have, you gotta have fun in life. You know, uh, life without fun. You know, one of the things about adults is that we forget to have children play. You know, and uh, in theater, that's why they call it a play because you go there, right, Michael? Or you play, and there's nothing wrong with playing early in the morning, but we got some serious uh, business to, to, I didn't say, Rosada, good morning, Anita, Scott, everybody, hey, hey. Good morning, good morning. That's what I'm talking about. Um, Rosada, has the COVID rate started to decline yet in uh, California? Uh, it has, it has according to figures, uh, but yesterday I, they started to warn everyone because it's starting to go up again. Uh oh. So people be acting, people act stupid. Yeah. You know, I, I was looking at the graph this morning and it showed that the spike sky in New York was higher in December at the end of it than it was last March. Jeez. Mm. I was like, whoa. Mm. That's many crazy. Mm. Wow. Huh? Michael? Christmas parties and people just, you know. Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanksgiving, well, Christmas, going home. And also traveling, kissing, hugging. And and doing other that, things that we're not gonna talk about on TV. And what just happened? Been trained to, people have just been trained not to, you know, to trust the government. You know, in, in other countries, um, you know, the government can put out a thing saying, don't do this, it's a bad idea, wear your mask, stay home, you know, whatever. Um, and you'll get a much higher rate of compliance here. You know, people have been so stuffed with with that kind of right wing, uh, you know. It's all about you. Yeah. Right, and they weren't even getting that message from the government in December, of course, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Tragic, criminal, even. Speaking of crimes, there was a terrible one in Atlanta over the last few days, eight people dead. And um, I'm astonished uh, that there's even a debate about whether or not it was racist and sexist silence. Yes. Uh, Rosanna, I mean, clear, clearly, if you kill six Asian women, I mean, on the face of it, no? I think they're trying to cover it up or trying to make it look like it's not a hate crime with this whole sex addiction, but I, I, I don't see the community buying it, you know, overall. It, it, like you said, clearly, when you have six women, they're all Asian who died. He's clearly targeted them. And, and we, we it just, it's just horrible. And the behavior of the uh, oh sorry Rosanna no no go for it Amy. oh uh, that the behavior of the of the law enforcement and the, their spokespersons was so despicable as well yes. and the idea that they would they would interview the this um, uh, uh, perpetrator and then just give his excuses to the public as if that were something that we wanted to hear and it was completely inappropriate and hateful really yeah and this this goes back to a, I mean it, it it's related to a. Um, an issue of um, legal interpretation that comes up occasionally in front of the Supreme Court, which is, you know, how can you, but basically to determine that a, a police officer um, has done something with racial animus or uh, something discriminatory, they actually have to, you know, use the N-word basically um, before it can be determined that, you know, they, they've done that their, their behavior is, is racially uh, discriminatory. Um, it's and, and kind of a similar thing here, right? This was objectively uh, racist and sexist violence, but there's this whole reticence, like the worst thing you can possibly say about a white person 
is that they're racist, right? That, oh, God, you know, God forbid that we should accuse somebody who just murdered, you know, eight Asian women as, as being racist. Oh. Yeah, anyway, it, it's disgusting. You see some pushback. I, I think, you know, I wonder sometimes if uh, the media and even the country as a whole would be having the same conversation if they were, you know, six immigrant women, you know, from Mexico or Honduras who were killed or six black men, you know, you wonder, but... I also think it's because we are living in a new period. You know, Trump's not around. It's not like we have this imminent fascist danger, but we we have to understand that this, you know, racist China virus rhetoric is still around. You know, that's what obviously motivated this. We have, you know, young Chinese people, uh, Chinese Americans here in New York who are afraid to leave their homes even, you know, and they live in Chinese American neighborhoods. So that's, you know, what we're facing right now. I think we have to listen to what the civil rights organizations are saying. They're saying it's a hate crime. You know, um, the same civil rights organizations who are talking about the things that are going on on the border. Yeah, Trump's not around anymore, but there's still, you know, hanky panky going on at the border. You know, it just doesn't change with um, change with the guard. I get with the change of the guard. You know, they, these uh, the remnants of, um, you know, white supremacy are, are still around and it's going to take what do you call it, Scott, a decisive defeat of the extreme <laughs> right <laughs> to get rid of these things, you know, once and for all. Clearly, and you know the uh, uh, Republicans, because they don't have any platform or program or anything to say about anything really meaningful, now are focusing on the situation that's taking place at the border and the buildup of uh, immigrants who are uh, trying to flee poverty and oppression and sexism and the drug trafficking and everything else, and um, and. That's all they got. That's all they got. And uh, Rosanna, how do you think uh, the uh, administration is handling things now? Is Are they going in the right direction or are they too soon well, to tell? What's your I, opinion? I, I think overall it's too soon to tell, but I think we need to be mindful of the fact that, you know, the, the right wing, uh, um, they, they, they attacked the Obama in the same way, you know, the, the, what they used to call him the deporter in chief. But if we look deeper into the whole situation, the border patrol and that whole administration doesn't have any like anyone uh, holding them accountable. So they pretty much can do whatever they want. The other thing is that a lot of people are fleeing their other countries because of the pandemic also, the economic toll that it's taken on the pen, you know, uh, by the pandemic and so, there is that. And then there's also uh, thinking, that, not, not thinking, but um, I hear of uh, situations where it's orchestrated. A lot of these are orchestrated in a way to, to uh, you know, have, have a, an excuse or a reason to start attacking and, and um, you know, the administration and all of these kinds of things. So I think we still have to uh, watch and see as well as, um, be, you know, look, dig deeper before you draw any conclusions about what's going on. I want to agree. I saw that the uh, immigration bill was so forward. Uh, what's the name of that bill, Michael? Uh, I saw a picture of Representative uh, from uh, Texas and Castro, is that his name? And Pelosi and Schumer and for the Dreamers. Right. The Dreamers bill. And uh, but does it have any chance in the Senate? Anybody? Anita, Anita wanted to say something. I think no. uh, just a second ago. That's okay. That's okay. We'll see. I mean, uh, as far as that uh, that question, and I don't know the name of that that bill, but uh, but I think it will have trouble in the Senate. But I think we're really pushing up against the filibuster now. That more and more people are seeing that you can't get anything past the Senate. So. Um, it's becoming more and more imperative to end the filibuster. So um, well, what I was going to say about the other thing, you can't have a 14-year-old, you can't take a 14-year-old who's just crossed the border and just turn him loose in, you know, uh, in Texas. You, you have to have some plan for making sure that that person is going to be taken care of. So, but I think, I think we have to really keep the um, bureaucracy, which is what it is, um, under surveillance to make sure they're not, you know, cutting corners or covering up or anything like that. We have to keep a watch on it. 
but I agree with Rosanna. We have to wait and see. Pat, don't pass judgment quite yet. It's too soon to tell. However, it's not too soon to tell that the uh, 100 vaccinations have already happened, more or less. So that's good. We can happy about that. And some of y'all got $1,400 checks in the mail mm -hmm. or in your uh, uh, savings or checking uh, account. Mm -hmm. And so we want everybody to forward that $1,400 to uh, People's World <laughs> and uh, help us reach our $75,000. Michael, uh, what do you think? I mean, we got to reach that goal, right? We're at 60,000 yeah. now. Who would have thought? Okay. For May Day, it's a great way to celebrate May Day as a support working class you know, news coverage. We've gotten one $1,400 check so far. So the more we get, the quicker we'll get there. The, the, I've been working on this thing for, I don't know, two, about a month now. And I'm not going to stop until we reach our goal. Right. Um, but I'm glad that people are getting some relief. But you know, the, the problems are so deep. I was thinking about the child poverty provision <clears throat> in the package, which is going to give a tax credit. And it's a step towards, it's, it's a step towards, what do they call that thing when you um, get monthly uh, basic Universal income, UBI? Basic income. Yeah. It's a step towards U, U, UBI. And how much is it, Scott? Is $300 a month? I believe so, yeah, but I'm not sure. $300 a month. And they say it'll cut child poverty in half. But you know what? When you consider that one half of all Black and Latino, one third rather, of all Black and Latino children are living below the poverty line, and then you take those who are living near the poverty line, it comes to half. Mm -hmm. So even if $300 is not going to rescue our children from poverty. It's going to help a month. You'll be able to eat and pay the gas bill and pay for your phone a little bit easier. But that's, you know, when school time comes or when somebody gets sick, that money's gone. And these systemic problems are so deep that it's really going to take uh, radical reforms of the of the political and economic system in order to, you know, deliver us from this crisis? Or am I just being a leftist? No, I, I think, think your, your analysis is correct. You know, it's, it's a, it, it isn't, it is a lot for those who really, really need it. $300, you know, seems like, it, and it will make a difference, but over the long haul, it's not gonna be sustainable uh, because prices are going up, everything's going up, and and um, parents are still going to have to work two two jobs to to really make and rent housing. It has to be an uh, an all encompassing uh, a relief plan, you know, that includes the housing and includes the education. That's really lifting people out of poverty. Exactly. Includes a, a shorter work week and you know uh, paid family leave and you know, guaranteed um, universal uh, preschool and, and, and child care, like all of those things go into this. And it, I, yeah, I think you're exactly right, Joe. It, this is gonna take, I mean, capitalism is at the root of this and, and it's not gonna be solved fully uh, under, under the present system at all. And this week we're celebrating the 150th anniversary of the Paris Commune. And Scott wrote an article about it. And Scott, you're arguing that the workers really weren't for socialism. How can you say something like that? They, 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 they were absolutely for socialism. Um, what, I'm arg what I argue is that if you look at the lead up to the Paris Commune, the whole siege of Paris at the end of the Franco-Prussian War, after the fall of the incredibly corrupt, repressive Second Empire, um, what you see, what laid the basis for the Commune, for the ability of the working class for the first time to take power was that the working class had been at the forefront of the struggle to protect democracy from the possibility of another, another empire, another monarchy, right? Um, and, and Marx points this out in, in the Civil War in France. He says that the whole people of Paris, including the, the middle class, shopkeepers, whatever, looked to the working class because they were the only force 
capable of taking a, a social initiative, right? Um, and it was even when the, the gun, when the people stood up to um, the army trying to take the, the cannons away from the National Guard, uh, it was the National Guard was the sort of guarantor of the possibility of continuing um, the, the Republican form of government that they had fought for since 1789. Um, so, out of that struggle emerged this socialist revolution where all of a sudden the working class is not just a partner, you know, in the struggle for, for a democracy generally, it's actually creating the first working class state, the first state where the working class holds power and uses it to reshape uh, social relations. Unless you compare it to the reconstruction governments in the South where uh, after the Civil War, the, uh, they were defending a Republican government, the Union against the slaveocracy, and poor Blacks and poor Whites came to power. And, and Anita uh, Du Bois says that those were working class kind of states. Do you agree with Du Bois? I do, I do, yes. I mean, it, it's a beginning of, of that. And of course they were attacked in the same way that a working class state would be attacked and defeated in 1876, was it? Uh, so, um, so I think Du Bois was on the right, on the right track there, yeah. Now the uh, problem though, Rosanna, is that the uh, uh, commune was drowned in blood. And I think I don't know, tens of thousands, we were debating earlier before the program started, how many people were killed and, and blood ran through the streets of, of, uh, of uh, Paris uh, when they, and, and when the communists were like mass murder. And so Marx said that the mistake that they made was that they didn't create a working class led state, you know? Um, and, uh, and, and that we need, and, and the lesson that needs to be learned is working class power. What do you think? Well, I think he's right, you know, uh, and I think, you know, it's unfortunate that sometimes we have to learn the hard way about what needs to be done, but we can't ignore the lessons that we learn and continue to, to move in a direction that, that takes those lessons into account. So, uh, you know, obviously the, work, the workers are the ones who have the ultimate power, always, always, always. Now, Scott, your very excellent article avoided that question of working class power. Why? Um, I, I think I actually used the term working class power. I certainly said working class government, working class state. Um, uh, <laughs> but I think the, the, term, the term you're trying to trying to get me to say is dictatorship of the proletariat, uh -oh. <laughs> which it absolutely was. Um, uh -oh. But, it's, uh, you know, but that I, I feel like, you know, is that the, is that the most salient, is the, is the dictatorship aspect of it the most salient? Um, and I don't think so. This, it was a working class um, government born out of the needs of the struggle for democracy and that, you know, use the, the, the means at its disposal to, to reshape society. Lightning round. The dictatorship of the proletariat is the form of working class power in the 21st century. Scott, yes or no? <laughs> Silence. Pass. Anita, yes or no? Pass too. I, I I think we need a new new con new concept, uh, you know, to to define things today. Rosanna, yes or no? We got two passes so far. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to join them. I think the term has a different kind of meaning to our to our working class today. Mm -hmm. But the the meaning of it, in terms of us having the power as workers, is still holds. So let, let's say, Michael. Let, I think, yeah, socialism is a form of working class power. You know, dictatorship of the proletariat to me just means, you know, workers' power, socialism. And so I'm for that. I think that's the future. However, I do agree 
that maybe that's not the term. Just like, I don't think I would walk up to someone in the street and say, hey, you want to learn about dialectical materialism? I don't think that's <laughs> how you communicate with people. And so, yeah, maybe break it down and explain. Yeah. Let, let's say that the, the working class power in the 21st century will be a dictatorship of the proletariat uh, in exactly the same way and to the same extent that our current society is a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. Um, I think that the use of the term dictatorship is, uh, you know, I mean, who wants to live in a dictatorship? Nobody. Nobody wants to. That's why we have Bill of Rights Socialism, you know, and where the rights of the working class are prioritized, you know, where we have uh, worker control. Now, Anita, you don't like that term, Bill of Rights Socialism. I can see you frowning, but oh, oh, the fact no. of the matter, huh? <laughs> I'm not frowning. I mean, I, I, I just have some little problems with Bill of Rights socialism. I don't want people to think that we think the Bill of Rights as is engaged in the US Constitution is enough. I think we need a, a right to tertiary education and a right to health care and a lot of other rights that aren't part of the Bill of Rights. Well, it's a foundation. We're talking about foundations and broadening and deepening and extending even, oops, uh, FDR had an economic bill of rights, if you remember, okay. that everybody has conveniently uh, forgotten. But the point I'm trying to make is that when we have a new society, new forms of governance are going to emerge. You know, I was reading an article today that said that even Thomas Jefferson put forward at the end of his life that the need for uh, a, a councils of direct uh, uh, citizen uh, participatory face-to-face -face, uh, democracy. And we saw that emerge in the commune, Scott, and we saw it emerge in the Russian Revolution, they were called Soviets. And we saw it emerge, Rosanna, in Cuba with the, uh, what do they call it? The- uh, Committees for uh, Defense of the Revolution. Committees for the Defense of, and I imagine that's gonna happen here, you know? And so, um, uh, but you don't wanna uh, define it uh, in any way as a, as, as a dictatorial in, this, in the popular imagination, right. which most people conceive of as Hitlerian, Mussolini, and one party Stalinian, uh, but I, you know, kind of, of, of states. And, and therefore, um, Rosanna, you're right, we got to find another way to define people's uh, working class, uh, anti-racist, anti-sexist democracy. I, ha I heard a young uh, YCLer one time explain this, that some, you know, someone on the street came up to us and said, you guys are for the dictatorship. And they said, well, what's wrong with people like you and me dictating how things should be instead of some billionaire? You know? And I <laughs> thought that was a very wise way to explain it. <laughs> I'm not touching that. No, 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 no. We don't, but, uh, we, we, we want to, um, exercise popular working class democracy. But it does and, mean a working class state will use state power um, to advance the interests of the working class in the same way that, you know, currently uh, state power through the, through the military, through um, whatever is used undemocratically, violently uh, to advance the, the interests of the ruling class. We'll do it differently, but the power of the state belongs to the I'm, going, I'm, I'm glad you said we're going to do it differently because we can't do it in the same way. Military can't be the same. No. The, the, you know, uh, police can't be. We need to defund, demilitarize the police. You know, we need to find alternative strategies for mm -hmm. uh, dealing with things. Anyway, it's been a good debate and uh, we want to wish everybody uh, healthy and safe weekends. Uh, next week, we'll be back. Uh, until then, stay sane if you can. <laughs> stay safe. I'm asking a lot. And, so. and yeah, I'm telling you. And stay in the fight. Take care. Good morning, revolution, everybody. Good morning, good morning. Later, comrades. Bye.